Install Gentoo. Okay, I'm convinced. So first off, before I get into this video, I still stand by practically everything I said in my previous video on why I use Arch. I still find Arch Linux to be a really good distribution and especially one of my top choices, especially since I'm still using it for servers and a few other use case scenarios. However, due to a few internal factors and otherwise, I basically was compelled to try and start maining Gen 2 Linux. This video has taken me a lot longer than usual to make, some of it being due to me getting used to Gen 2 and having to make a couple of mistakes, and also due to the amount of content I want to push in this video. Like always, resources and references will be linked in the description so you can do your own research, and also so you can see where I got my information. One of those sources being Mental Outlaws Gen 2 Important Details video, which is probably one of the best videos on learning exactly what Gen 2 is from a high level and that video is probably responsible for me looking more into Gen 2. And there's a good chance I regurgitate some of the information from that video, even though I'll do my best to avoid doing so. With all that said, Gen 2's been very fun. For many reasons, Gen 2 might be one of my favorites, if not the favorite distribution that I've used. Or it might be tied with Arch, I'm not gonna lie, because Arch is still very, very good. It's probably good this video is coming out after a month or two after I've switched to Gen 2 because now I'm pretty confident on how the distribution works. And now I have quite a bit of experience using the distribution and can explain things with more context. I used Gen 2 earlier this year on the Learner ThinkPad and I just want to shout out my school for allowing me to do that. Thank you. I'm sorry. I used this as one of my main computers in my arsenal for about two months on OpenRC. And on my desktop, this is actually the first time I'm using SystemD on Gen 2 instead of OpenRC. So let's actually explore that. What is SystemD and what is OpenRC? They're both ended systems that are responsible for handling services, starting, rebooting, suspending, and shutting down your system. OpenRC is made by the Gen 2 developers and is developed for Gen 2. SystemD, however, is on practically every other distribution. Arch, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, Debian, Fedora, etc. They all use SystemD. Some people have a strong stance on SystemD, which is another reason why they may move to Gen 2 so that they can switch out their end system, while others are used to SystemD like me and they like the choice that is supported on Gen 2. And one of the main reasons why I'm using SystemD on the desktop is just to make things easier for myself. But on a laptop that I recently received, I put Gen 2 on there and I'm learning OpenRC on that install. The commands can vary quite a bit between OpenRC and SystemD and this is just end systems in general. So if you're just slowly getting into Gen 2 or you don't want to move away from the comfortability of SystemD, I'd recommend using their SystemD builds and profiles. But like I said earlier, there are groups that absolutely despise SystemD, so if that's you, don't listen to me, go OpenRC and OpenRC is pretty good and it's very minimalist, but me personally, I never really had any personal issues with SystemD and for me, it's just fine. But besides end system flexibility, one of the biggest features and hurdles to newcomers on using Gen 2 would be its source-based nature. This is probably why I waited to install Gen 2 on my desktop for so long, especially since I had a mostly working Arch system. I'll let you know right now, it's not that bad and this is coming from someone who likes Linux. I love seeing my computer do things. If you decide to plan out your system updates weekly, which is what I started to do after Arch started to kind of break more for me, then you won't run into many issues. You'll most likely have to leave your system compiling updates overnight, which is what I usually do. Recently, what I started to do is if I'm going to be busy or if I'm not going to be on the computer, I'll just SSH and have my computer run updates. I just run a string commands and once it's finished, it will either reboot or power off whatever power command I have at the end of that string. The payoff from this is that you have a very stable system with packages compiled with features you exactly stated. And depending on if you told Portage to compile specifically for your CPU and your CPU architecture, you might gain a slight performance boost. I've always felt that any Gen 2 build I do is extremely fast. For some people, it won't be noticeably faster, but it's definitely fast. So if you're looking to squeeze more life out of an older computer and you're willing to go down this rabbit hole, 
you might actually get that. This also makes Gen 2 pretty good for gaming too, which you have a minimal system with features that you chose to compile and any features that you decided to exclude or just not there. And you have packages and binaries specifically compiled to fit your system configuration. Basically, this is one step down from the Linux from scratch project, except the system is practically usable for regular daily use. If you decide to compile everything from source, you can actually say that you built your own Linux system, especially with your system compiling all of its packages itself. Another thing that Gen2 developers decided to include, which was very considerate, was the ability to also install binary packages. If you want to create a server to be a bin host, meaning that server compiles all of your Gen2 packages for you, and then you can just host it later for your computer to pull its packages and install all those binaries that was compiled on that server. Or you can use Gentoo's own bin house. So you can download their binaries and those binaries can also match your use flags. Basically, Gentoo provides ultimate flexibility when it comes to compilation and installing and downloading binaries for convenience. One strong point of Gen 2 is the excess amount of choice the distribution gives you. If you want to avoid compiling packages all the time, you can choose to install binary packages instead. Now you may be wondering, if I'm installing binary packages, what is the point of using Gen 2 at all? One of Gen 2's core features is use flags, where you can describe exactly what your system is going to use, and Portage, Gen 2's package manager, will install binaries or ebuilds, packages for you to compile, in respect to those flags. You can have binaries ignore the use flags, but Gen 2 does distribute some binaries that fully respect certain sets of use flags. Examples of use flags may include KDE, Bluetooth, Wi Fi, Flatpak, Wayland, etc. That means you can literally compile your entire system to not use Bluetooth or Wi-Fi if you desire. This is actually what I've done for my recently created Gen 2 server. Portage use flags are probably my favorite feature of Gen 2 so far as it's allowed me to compile my packages with extra features or remove them if unnecessary. So just as an example, if we're keeping use flags in mind, there are quite a few duplicate packages found within other distributions repositories. Pipewire, in this instance, is a great example. I personally like using Jack to have fine-grained controlled on which audio devices are connecting where. Basically, I like piping my Bluetooth phone audio to my XLR amplifier to handle phone calls at times. I use Pipewire as my sound service, and I wanted to use Pipewire with Jack to use this functionality. On Arch Linux, this is a separate package named Pipewire-Jack, whereas with Gen 2, you can compile Pipewire with Jack support by enabling the Jack SDK use flag. I personally like this approach more since it gives me more control on which packages have certain types of support compiled in comparison with other distributions. Gen2 also provides different use flag profiles for different setups. For example, the Gen2 GNOME profile with System D will automatically set some use flags in accordance with that profile. Because of the use flag feature and other advancements that Portage has made, such as the slot system, Portage easily becomes one of the most advanced package managers in comparison to other distributions. So, real quick, I want to shoehorn this section in here to talk about the slot system for probably about a paragraph or two. The slot system basically allows you to install two versions of the same package to your system for packages that support it. Example, if you want to have two versions of PHP, you can choose which version of PHP is active via the eSelect command. This applies to the kernel, wine formulating Windows applications, editors, Emacs, Ruby, Rust, and anything that contains an eSelect file that supplies an eSelect module. Earlier I mentioned that Gen2 is a meta distribution. When I was doing research on this topic, I found that Gen 2's definition and other meta distributions definitions such as Bedrock Linux had different scopes on what they defined as a meta distribution. Gen 2 calls themselves a meta distribution because they are providing the tooling for building packages rather than providing distributed binary packages or providing entirely binary distributed packages to its users. Bedrock Linux calls themselves a meta distribution since you take parts of other distributions to create a completely custom experience. And don't worry, I'm not disc dropping again anytime soon, so there's not going to be another I switched to Bedrock Linux video by the end of the month, okay? Just trust me on that. But I did use Bedrock Linux in a VM, and I basically came to this. A meta distribution is a Linux distribution that gives you the tools and framework to effectively create your own custom operating system and combine features that would usually clash against each other into a cohesive and usable system. While Arch Linux is very minimalist, it still distributes primarily binary packages and has very simple tools to maintain an Arch Linux distribution. Arch Linux makes some decisions for the user that is in line with their ethos. 
Gen 2 and Bedrock simply do not care. Gen 2 allows you to flat out compile custom packages and Bedrock Linux allows you to turn something like NixOS into an actually usable distribution. So onto the subject of stability, Gen 2 has pretty good stability for a rolling release distribution, which could be a selling point to some people for actually giving it a try. How stable a distribution is depends on the quality control the maintainers put in place. If you look at OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, OpenSUSE's rolling release distribution, it is known as one of the most stable distributions especially with OpenSUSE being based off an enterprise distribution. Arch Linux is more bleeding edge and receives more recent packages that are as close to upstream as possible from the package maintainers. This is, however, as many of you are aware, at the cost of some stability. Gen 2's quality control means that packages may stay in testing for quite some time before being moved to stable channels. Even though I have backups in place, I really don't have that anxiety that an update will completely break my system like I used to with Arch. Gen 2's quality assurance project assures that their ebuild repository is kept consistent and they also state that they keep technical documentation up to date to assist with development. So if you care a lot about the stability of your system like I've started to, you can rest assured that your system will remain stable when you're upgrading your system with Gen 2. One of the more unique things about Gen 2 would be its installation method, primarily due to the fact that it's a meta distribution. Meta distributions tend to have very unique installation methods. For example, with Bedrock Linux, you're usually taking an existing Linux distribution and then hijacking it with a script to turn it into Bedrock Linux, with using the other distribution as more or less its base. With Gen 2, you can use their own provided live ISOs to go through the motions of installing the system, but Gen 2 almost expects you to use other Linux live ISOs instead, mainly because the system is installed by unpacking a stage 3 tar file, which is basically a entire system in a archive file like a zip, .rar, etc and they expect you to unpack this in the root of where the operating system is going to reside. There's nothing environment specific that you would need to install Gen 2, like there is when it comes to Debian or Arch, like dbootstrap or packstrap. You can utilize tools such as Archtrude or genfstab from the Arch ISOs, but that's entirely optional, although it is kind of recommended. If you need a browser to read the wiki while installing on the same computer, you can use the Linux Mint ISO and install it that way if you prefer. As you saw in the intro, I personally used my Arch Linux install at the time to install Gen Gen 2 on a different BTRFS subvolume. If you're using BTRFS or another volume based file system, you don't even need to use an installation medium, and that's probably one of the coolest things about DIY and meta distributions, mainly because installation methods are very flexible for various circumstances. If you watch my Archstrap video, you'll see Arch and other distributions such as Debian can also do similar installations with their respective installation commands as I explained earlier with packstrap for Arch or dbootstrap for Debian. However, meta distributions such as Gen2 and Bedrock expect this flexibility and some knowledge and experience at the installation process. So who is Gen2 met for? For those who don't know yet, the distribution has been named the end game of Linux by Mental Outlaw and maybe a few others. It's not Linux from scratch, but I cannot recommend Gen 2 for newcomers. This is a system that can't just be reinstalled if something goes wrong. Reinstalling Gen 2 means recompiling the entire system. That being said, reinstalling Gen 2 has gotten better with Gen 2 including an optional bin host for those who want to use it. But it doesn't change the fact that this distribution requires patience, experience, and understanding the core fundamentals and basics of Linux. And reinstalling Gen 2, if there's an issue, should be used as an absolute last resort. Gen 2 is aimed at Linux experts and enthusiasts, and for those who really love the Linux family of operating systems. This is an operating system that requires patience and those who are willing to go the extra mile to get things working. But with that said, Gen 2 is very stable and I haven't really had to tweak anything since I installed Gen 2 about two months ago. So to conclude, I like Gen 2 quite a bit and I aim to use Gen 2 on my production desktop for at least a year. I used Arch as my daily driver for two to three years, so I'm not really worried about doing the same with Gen 2. That being said, as I'm recording this, I'm compiling Chromium, so... Yeah, I've been using Gen 2 for a good amount of the year and I'm pretty sure I stick with it for quite a bit. And I'll reiterate again, the distribution requires a lot of patience. But the main question is, are you interested in trying Gen 2? And if so, I hope this video pointed you in the right direction. Thank you for waiting for me to put this video together. I've been working on it for about two months and I got delayed due to the usual suspects and the fact that I wanted to push a lot of content in this video. So thank you for being patient. Seriously, that's all for now. Until next time. Thank you.